When we talk about lipid membranes, we often talk about the phospholipid bilayer. The acyl chain is simply the portion, the lipid portion of the phospholipid bilayer. So each one of these is an acyl chain. This picture just shows sort of the big picture of the phospholipids and then how those inc are incorporated into a bilayer. There are many different types of lipids in bilayers, more than 100 different lipids, and the differences in these acyl chains are what make those different, different lipids in the bilayer. The primary difference in the acyl chains is based on their length and degree of satur saturation. The most common length for the acyl chains are about 10 to 24 carbons long, and they're usually an even number of carbons. This picture also shows how the individual acyl chains can be different within, a, within one phospholipid. So one here is saturated, this acyl chain is monounsaturated, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. The nomenclature for these acyl chains is based primarily on their length and degree of saturation. So acyl chains can either be saturated, monounsaturated, or polyunsaturated. So they're saturated if they have no double bonds, monounsaturated with one double bond, and polyunsaturated with multiple double bonds. We can count from two different ends. So if we're counting from the carboxyl end, down here, that gives us the delta nomenclature. So in this case, the 18 tells us that it's an 18 carbon acyl chain with one double bond. And we see that the double bond starts at the carbon that's nine carbons from the carboxyl end. So here's the carboxyl end. So this delta nine is what that indicates. Nine carbons over is where that double bond is. On the um, lipid below that, you can see it's a polyunsaturated fat with 20 carbons, five double bonds, and if we start at the carboxyl end, the first double bond starts at carbon number five, which is right here. And then the double bonds are every third bond uh, thereafter throughout the um, acyl chain. The other method of counting is from the omega end, which is opposite the opposite end as the carboxyl end. The, in this case, then, this is an omega-3 fatty acid because if we count one, two, three carbons from the omega end, that's where that first double bond is. So that's how this can be called an omega-3 fatty acid. So basically just two ways of two different types of nomenclature depending if we start counting over from the carbon beginning on the carboxyl end or the omega end. As we know, membranes are fluid, but the extent of their fluidity depends both on the degree of saturation as well as the length of those acyl chains. But another factor that affects fluidity is um, temperature. So I think bacon is a great example of uh, uh, fat that changes uh, fluidity based on the temperature. So we can all kind of picture bacon when it's cold, um, that before it's been cooked, it's solid, and then we cook it and it starts to turn somewhat liquid. There's some liquidy fat in there. And then that fat, once you cool it down, back down to room temperature, um, we get the lovely bacon grease. Um, so it gets solid again. So this just kind of, I think, is an easy visual thinking about how um, the, um, fats are, their, the fluidity of fats is affected by temperature. So when, when it's hot, it's liquid. We can see that liquid um, fat from the bacon in the pan. And then when it gets um, cold again, it's back to solid at room temperature. In food, there's actually generally a mix of both saturated and unsaturated fats, but foods are typically classified as either saturated or unsaturated based on what, what type of fat predominates. So in bacon, most of the fat is saturated, but it doesn't mean there isn't some unsaturated fat within bacon as well. And then the fat that you eat actually can get incorporated, does get incorporated into the cell membranes because that's what becomes uh, available for the body to use. Another factor related to the acyl chains and how they sit in the membrane is their conformation in either a cis or a trans conformation. So the trans conformation is um, straight pretty much as you can see in this bottom image here. When a double bond creates the cis conformation, it creates sort of a kink in the acyl chain, which makes it not pack so tightly together. So again, as a food example, um, when foods are, um, trans fats can be created, that trans structure, by hydrogenating foods, so adding hydrogens to those double bonds. So in some respects, it takes an unsaturated fat and 
and fills those double bonds with hydrogen and it changes the conformation to an artificial trans conformation, uh, which changes the texture of the food and also it um, by decreasing those number of double bonds, it decreases its uh, susceptibility to oxidation, which is actually desirable by food manufacturing companies because it makes the product more shelf stable and it also affects the texture of the food.